Indie Beacon Radio with host B. Allen Bourgeois. Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag Indie Beacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Indie Beacon Show. I have Gary Greenberg with me today, and welcome, Gary. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, it's a pleasure. So we've got a lot to talk about. So let's start with the basics. What got you to start writing your first book? Um, well, I actually, I don't know. I've always been kind of a writer since I'm a little kid. I've always enjoyed writing. I've always been pretty good at it. I always like essay tests better than objective tests. So uh, I've always been a writer. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. And my, my father, uh, told me that, you know, since I was good at writing and I like to travel, I should go into journalism. So that's what I did. So I've been a reporter and an editor for various newspapers along the way. Um, my first book I actually wrote when I was, uh, I started it when I, I was in uh, Florida International University. I was, I was in the first class of their uh, master's in creative writing program, um, which put out Dennis Lehane and, and uh, Jim Hall and a bunch of other people. And um, I was in that first class there, and, and we had an assignment to do a crime novel. And I started a chapter with that, and I ended up uh, writing a book about it, and it was called Dead Man's Tale. It's kind of a, a new age, uh, sci-fi, gothic romance, crime thriller set in Miami. And uh, part of the time I wrote it, I had a grant from the state for, uh, I had one for fiction writing for like five grand. And it could afford me to spend a year as a bridge tender. So I got a job as a bridge tender uh, where nobody could really bother you. And that's where I wrote most of the books, sitting on the bridge in uh, Hollandale Beach and, and uh, the Rickenbacker Causeway, uh, Miami River, different, different bridges throughout the counties. And uh, nobody is allowed to bother you, so it's great. So you can sit there all day and write. And you put the bridge up every once in a while for a little distraction and then uh, you get back to writing. So that, that was my first book, and I published that myself in 2001. And uh, I didn't publish another book for a long time because I, you know, was making a living as a reporter and as a writer, a freelance writer. So let's go back for a second, because you said, if I heard you correctly, New Age, Gothic, wrote, um, Murder Mystery. How did all those different things come together? Because they really don't always work together. No, I, I've, I've never really, you know, fit in any one particular genre. I'm uh, like a trans genre person as far as a writer goes. And, and um, this book is about uh, a reporter who gets involved in, a, in a, uh, a situation where he's investigating a story and, you know, the guys come after him. He doesn't even know which story it is. But while he's doing that, he uh, ends up uh, running into a woman who is a channel to the afterlife and he develops a relationship with her and then he, they also run into this guy who's a mad scientist basically who's trying to read people's minds and uh, he has his big dome down in Florida down in uh, he's a rich guy you know and, and, and he built this big dome and he can then this machine it you know looks like the synapse of a brain inside and he can read people's minds and he uses all these derelicts to read people's minds. And one day one of the derelicts dies. And instead of the machine just clicking off, it, it follows his soul towards the afterlife. And then it cuts off. So the doctor gets, you know, consumed with trying to figure out what happens after you die. So it's got all these elements of, in it. It's got this mystical element. It's kind of like almost like a uh, cross between Elmore Leonard and the, uh, and the Celestine prophecy. You know, it's, it's got all these different elements in it. And it was really fun to write. It sounds interesting. And I'm sure a lot of research had to go into it, but also a lot of creative fun as well. Well, you know, I, I, I'm one of these people that I, I can't have a plan when I write a book. I just got to start it and see where it leads me. And I had this general concept. Originally, I had written a short story about it, a scientist who invented a mind, re a mind reading machine and, you know, that, that part of it. And uh, then I can kind of combine it with the crime thriller when I had to start this crime novel in my, in my writing class. 
So, uh, you know, it's, it's just weird, but uh, I, I'm not one of these guys who can work off an outline. I like to know, I don't, I don't like to know what's going to happen. Okay. So you mentioned that was your first book and your last one for a while because you were doing a lot of journalism, which actually kind of brings into the, in the next book we'll talk about. But as a journalist, um, did you find a lot of interesting stories that needed to be told later down the road or something? Well, as a journalist, you, 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 you collect a lot of mostly useless information about everything because, you, you know, I've done everything from City Hall to sports to, to features to, you know, just about anything you can name. I've interviewed some really, really, uh, you know, successful people. I've, 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 that's what I love about journalism is you get thrust into all these different, um, you know, kind of situations and, and places and you learn about all this stuff and, and in the back of your mind, all this stuff settles the characters you meet and you pull a little bit from all of that, you know, when you need it. It's just, it's just more stuff out there because you're, when you're a journalist, you're thrust into, into meeting people and, and having to cover events that you might know nothing about. So you learn about them and then you can then use that, that, you know, that race or that tennis tournament or that zoo or whatever it is that you, had to write a story about, you can use some of that or the characters uh, that you had met in your, in your fiction. So, okay, so this brings us to the, the book about Robert Durst, um, because you co-wrote it with an inmate who spent time with him. How did that come about? That was a really interesting story. I was working for the tabloids uh, for, right, as a staff writer for the Globe supermarket tabloid, and I got called for jury duty. It was a murder trial. And one of the um, one of the defendants, uh, one of the, one of the guys who testified for the defense was a basically a jailhouse snitch, and um, he helped actually the guy get off in the end. But uh, he, the judge, used to joke that you know to me about well you can't put this in the tabloids, Gary, you know because you know when you go for jury duty they find out what you do and all. So he would joke with me about it. So this inmate knew I worked for the tabloids, and then he got his lawyer to contact me and said he wanted to, you know, uh, tell me about all his life experiences. And he was a very colorful jewel thief in uh, South Florida, and he had all these great stories about about you know befriending the rich and famous and then ripping them off, and you know, it's just a lot of funny stories. Uh, and we developed kind of a penmanship uh, relationship over the years, and then at one point uh, he told me about this, this story he had done with another author who, who quit on him about his relationship with Robert Durst. And Robert Durst is, is probably the wealthiest serial killer in America. I mean, this guy's family owns billions of real estate uh, in New York. And uh, he's a nutcase and he kills people and he likes to kill people. And uh, this guy, his name's Bill, uh, was, uh, he was at a... Um, he, he was uh, at a school for uh, locksmithing in New York, and he literally bumped into Durst on the street one day. And Durst, you know, was ready to kill him because he spilled some soda on Durst. And Durst was yelling and screaming at him, and uh, uh, his girlfriend was, you know, trying to separate them. And, and Bill's boy, you know, friend was trying to separate him. And uh, eventually, they struck up a friendship. And Durst used to come over to this guy's house in Brooklyn, and he'd bring prostitutes. And he'd do all these weird things with prostitutes in uh, the basement of this guy's house. And, and he developed kind of this weird relationship with a serial killer. He didn't realize he was a serial killer at the time. He thought he was just kind of like, you know, crazy man who lived this fantasy world. But um, he eventually confessed to some of the killings, including his wife, uh, Kathy, and tried to uh, get my uh, friend, now friend, to kill Susan Berman. Durst is now on trial in LA for, for killing her. So we'll see what happens. But uh, his inmate, he's in jail and he'll be out in uh, February, if not sooner. And uh, he calls me all the time. I talked to him today and uh, he was telling me more stories. He used to live down here in, in Florida. And, uh, you know, he's, he's become a friend of mine. He's a, he's a reformed criminal. He's Christian. He wants, he's been a uh, confidential informant for years. He's He's helped to put many bad, bad people away. So that's one of the interesting things. If I hadn't been a writer, you know, I wouldn't run into a person like that. He's really a very fascinating character. And he's, he's really taught me a lot. And my immediate thought is, okay, he gets out in February. And if it, he's ratted on all these people, his life may not be 
alive much longer. Well, that's 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 the uh, that's the problem with that. But they try to keep it as as uh, you know as anonymous as possible. And our book is written. His we use an alias for him in the book. His alias is William Steele. Uh, so that's the alias we use. And and yeah. And, Maybe they could. A lot of them are, are put away, but he he knew uh, he knew Epstein. He knew uh, he's he's known a lot of like really famous people. Uh, and we just did a story for the Sun and the New York Post about his uh, running into Epstein one day in Palm Beach, and, and then the you know him going to Epstein's house and witnessing what went on there. And he's he can name some names. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we could get into a lot more conversation about that, but we won't because we're going to be talking more about your book. We're going to step away, let our sponsors do their thing. We'll come back and talk to Gary about his book, The Beard Died, in just a moment. Do you send book sales to a company that takes most of your money? Want to earn more money from your book sales? Do you want a bookstore that supports you? Introducing a new bookstore for indie authors and small press, B4R.store. Earn up to 80% of your book sales and learn how to market yourself, B4R.store. I'm Rox Berkey. And I'm Charles Brakefield. We're award-winning co-authors, Brakefield and Berkey, of the Enigma book series. There are 10 books in these series, with book number 11 planned for release in January 2020. Each story has a central technology focus ranging from identity theft to cryptocurrency and now AI wars. These adult techno thrillers pit cyber good guys against cyber thugs across the dark net. In our world, technology is today's weapon of choice. You can enjoy ebook format, paper, or audible. We want your feedback. Until the next story, thank you. Thanks. Join us for the 6th Annual Authors Marketing Event in Granbury, Texas on July 23rd to the 25th, 2021, where authors share ideas and learn from the professionals over a two-day weekend. Receive your book marketing certification from the only organization in the world that has been doing it for five years, Authors Marketing Guild, a membership-based organization that supports authors from around the world. Learn more at ame.authorsmarketingguild.com. Sponsored by IndieLector.Store, a bookstore that pays authors their fair share. Hello, I am the author and poet Denise Bryson. I am the author of The Things That Cross My Mind, Loves Reality, both in book and audio form. I am also noted as one of the best poets of 2011. I have two new projects coming up. One is the Blinky series, where Blinky tells us all about our coins and our bills for our children. I also have a book coming out called Say Ye. It's quotes from Denise Bryson. Just inspirational and that will help you along the way. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. And welcome back. This is Beyond Bourgeois and I have Gary Greenberg with me. And so we've been talking about his previous books, and now we want to talk about his most recent book called The Beer Diet. So do tell what this is all about, Gary. Well, it's actually called The Beer Diet, uh, How to Drink Beer and Not Gain Weight. And that's a very important thing in America these days, because with all the, the popular craft beers out there that are very high calorie, uh, high carb beers, you know, people enjoy these beers and they drink too much and they not only gain weight, but they destroy their health. <clears throat> and that was kind of happening to me maybe about 10 years ago. And I started putting on some weight and uh, I realized that this couldn't go on. So I actually, you know, as a health writer, I, I started following what I was writing about. And I found ways, uh, little simple adjustments to your lifestyle that can help you drink beer, you know, in some moderation and not gain weight. I'm 66. I weigh the same I weighed. 10 years ago, and uh, I still play some rugby. I still run around with the kids, and, and, and uh, I feel good. So how do I do it? And this is what the book's about. And of course, you don't want to give away any details because you want people to buy the book. 
always want people to buy the book, but I offer whatever free advice you want. And, and you know, I think the main thing is taking responsibility for your health. I mean, if you want to just not worry about it and, and eat whatever you want and do whatever you want and then go to the doctor and expect the doctor to cure you with a, a pill or a procedure or something, then, then that's going to be a problem. So the first lesson is that you have to take responsibility for your health. You have to understand your body. You have to understand how things affect your body, particularly what you put in your mouth. Alcohol is very, very bad. <laughs> I call it the demon in my book all the way through. I don't even talk about it till the very end of the book because I don't want to bum everybody out. But alcohol is a problem. And that's the main reason why you have to moderate uh, your beer drink. But uh, yeah. You mentioned craft beers. So I assume when you were getting the way you were testing out all these different types of beers or how did that come about? Well, I, you know, I'm a, as a rugby player, we drink a lot of beer and I've always been one of these guys that I, even as, as an early beer drinker, I gravitated towards uh, imported beers because they had a lot more flavor. And uh, when the craft beer scene started coming around around the turn of the millennium, it, it kind of began to gain momentum. Uh, I ran into some craft beers and realized that, hey, these are even tastier than most of the imports. And I started, uh, you know, just trying a lot of different beers. And then I started brewing my own. Now, you mentioned you as a rugby player. You've actually had a, a short article run about that. Um, doing the beer and being an athlete don't always work together. Um, so I'm curious how you were still gaining weight even though you were a rugby player. Well, I, I was fine till I hit my mid forties. When I hit my mid forties, your metabolism starts slowing down and you can do exactly what you have always done all your life and you're gonna gain weight. And those, that was the 10 years I put on about 20 pounds. It was like one or two pounds a year. It didn't seem like any big deal, but. I went from basically, you know, mid 150s to 175. And for me, that's a lot of weight. So I've now dropped back down and it's about 160. And I, you know, I've been staying there for a long time, 10 years. So how long have you been playing rugby? I started in uh, when I, 1975. So a long time. Yeah. And you, and you still get to enjoy it. Are you one of the oldest players or is there a large group of older players? We have now, you see my generation, you know, we never wanted to quit being kids. So there's quite a bit of my generation that continues to play. We play old boys, you know, when you see it on film, it's very embarrassing to watch us, but you know, you have those one or two moments during the game where you feel like some, you did something really good and that kind of uh, makes it worthwhile. And, and you know, with rugby, it's, it's, it's more than the sport. The game is a great game. It's really fun to play. But it's the camaraderie uh, amongst the players that is very, very unique in sports. I've never seen anything like it in any other sports. I covered sports. I played a lot of different games. Nothing like the rugby fraternity. And it's worldwide. I've gone all over Europe and all. Wherever I go, I find the local rugby club. And I have a band of brothers. And it's just wonderful. Right. Now, you mentioned that you also wrote as far as health and um, education. Is that anything you're working on as far as a new book or anything? Well, mostly what I do is I write like two or three health stories a week, and they're all on different topics. They're all almost all natural health. Uh, this week, I'm writing one on uh, molecular hydrogen, which is uh, hydrogen, the little tiny little molecule, the smallest in the universe, actually turns out to breed a really great antioxidant if you can uh, drink it in a, in a solution. And um, did one on autophagy, which is how cells recycle themselves. And you learn all this neat stuff. So, so that's mainly what I do. Um, I did take time to write a book. I got contracted to write a book by uh, from Newsmax called The Collation Revolution. So I wrote that, that just came out around the same time as the beer diet and chelation is a heavy metal detox. And it's a really interesting story because it's been kind of shunned by the medical establishment. But this uh, cardiologist in Miami named uh, Dr. Lamas uh, did a really good study that they couldn't deny. And uh, so it's gaining some credibility now. Please do tell us a little bit more about it. Well, you know, heavy metals are extremely serious business and we're all contaminated with them. And, you know, the, the, the kind of like the general consensus is 
they affect some people more than others. And these trace amounts we have from breathing the air and drinking the water and, and bathing and, and breathing and whatever it is, you know, uh, we, we constantly accumulate these heavy, heavy metals in our systems and they don't leave. There's no way really for us to get rid of them, you know, gracefully. Some of us are better at, at getting rid of them than others, but a lot of us aren't. And they settle in, in the bones, lead settles in bones, and mercury settles in kidneys and brains, and it's just really bad stuff. And there's really no way to get it out other than uh, with these substances that are called chelators. And the most effective one is an infusion, but you can also do suppositories, and there's some oral stuff you can try, but uh, mostly infusions work the best. And one of the things they've noticed and what Dr. Lamas, he's a cardiologist, did a study about is that they, they help uh, uh, arteriosclerosis. So they, they can remove plaque from your arteries. Once you do these chelations, uh, it removes calcium from, it, it removes calcium from where you don't want it, along with uh, lead and cadmium and mercury and other heavy metals that we've accumulated. So it's a really interesting topic. I actually embedded myself in, a, in one of the top chelation clinics in uh, Michigan, uh, Dr. Tammy Bourne's clinic in Grand Rapids. And uh, I embedded myself in there for a week and I talked to the staff, the doctors, all the patients and, and had it done myself and really got a good feel for it. And, and it's amazing the, the stories you hear from these patients about how they healed from all these different ailments, chronic disease and how it's helped them is just, uh, it's remarkable. Great. So um, we've got just a couple minutes left of this up, um, section of the show. Are you working on any other books? Do you have story ideas coming to mind that you want to play with or what? Well, I have a million story ideas for books, but I, I, at this point, I don't, I'm not working on anything because I just have too much else that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing. You know, for me, I'm a one-man show. I'm a one-man operation. And, and, you know, just to try to promote the beer diet, and keep up with my regular work to pay the rent is, is kind of occupying most of my time, but I am not short for ideas. I, I would love to write some more fiction. I have a whole collection of children's stories uh, that are ready to go. They're called uh, Read Aloud Tales because they're designed for parents to read the kids and they're funny. They're good for parents, they're good for kids, they're good for everybody. I have a whole collection I, I called Mortality Tales, literary fiction, you know, all, you know, kind of dealing with mortality. Uh, so I have a lot of stuff that's already written that I've never uh, actually produced, published, or marketed. But um, there, I still got plenty of ideas, and I'm hoping actually, uh, you know, with all these, uh, with all Netflix and Amazon and all these people producing all these movies, I mean, there's there's got to be some great opportunity out there. I have wonderful ideas for, you know, series and shows and all that. So if I can connect with the right person, I mean, I, there's no stopping me. Sounds good. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about some more in a moment. We're going to step away, let our sponsors do their thing, and we'll be back to wrap up the show. Authors Marketing Guild is a membership-owned organization designed to help authors succeed and learn how to better market and sell themselves and their books. Join us at AuthorsMarketingGuild.com and receive so many benefits you'll wonder why you didn't join sooner. That's AuthorsMarketingGuild.com. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. And welcome back. This is your host, Beyond Bourgeois, and I have Gary Greenberg with me. We've been talking about a wide variety of his books, um, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, of course, as you can see behind him, he has the beer diet and all those wonderful beers enticing you to have a drink and gain some weight, but that's not what his book is about. So Gary, let's, I mean, the beer diet is your newest one for the most part that you are really happy with. Um, where can people find it? Well, right now it's, uh, you know, it's available on Amazon. Uh, I, I uh, have it, you know, 
uh, register with Ingram Spark. So I'm working on trying to get into some bookstores. I do have a PR company that works with me and we've had quite a few uh, reviewers now that have the book that are reviewing it, early signs, everybody seems to love it. Uh, I've been featured in uh, Miami New Times, I've been the National Examiner tabloid and, and a few others working on the Sun, uh, the British paper uh, and some others. So I've, I've, and I've done a few interviews as well. So and podcasts. So, you know, things are, are developing, I'm progressing. Uh, it's funny how you can get an article in a National Examiner, which is probably got a circulation of 50,000, 80,000, and still not get many cells out of it. So um, it's, it's a process, that's all I can say. Maybe some of those readers enjoy having their beer gut and don't want to lose it. Yeah, it, most people don't care, but it's kind of, I wrote it kind of like, it was almost like a novelty idea, you know, that, that here is something, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a joke gift that somebody, you know, a girlfriend would get her boyfriend, if she thinks drinks too much beer, you know, for just get him a funny gift, you know, but it actually has some good valuable stuff. And I have a very entertaining writing style. So people who read my stuff like it, it's, it's mostly a memoir, it's mostly storytelling, you know, it's about health, but it's also about uh, my life, and I, I kind of have a, an entertaining way of presenting things. So, um, you know, people like it. Anybody website? who reads it likes it. So we'll see what happens. Do you have a website? Yeah, uh, there's one, uh, The Beer Diet, with hyphens between the and beer, uh, diet.com. So they could go there. I also do a uh, video. I got a YouTube channel called The Beer Diet Guy, and I do these really quirky little videos about beer and I got, uh, my dog loves to chew up beer cans. You know, she's really funny, Roxanne. Uh, my wife's a character. I got a turtle. I sit by my turtle pen and I make these little videos and they're, they're pretty funny. I'm starting to get a little bit of a following. So check out the Beer Diet Guy on YouTube. And, and to be clear, it's Guy, G-U-Y and not Guide. Yeah, G-U-Y, the, yeah. the Beer Diet Guy, G-U-Y. Okay, cool. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, you're not working on anything new at the moment and stuff. You're just focusing in on the writing that you do. Um, do you have social media outlets that people can follow you and, and see what? Yeah, uh, the, the Beer Diet guy has, uh, you know, a Facebook page, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm not, I'm not a great uh, social media guy. My PR people do a lot of that stuff, but um, it's good to have it out there and, and uh, I'm more, the YouTube video is fun. That's fun to do. It's almost like writing. You shoot these things. I, I got a program I can edit stuff and uh, it's creative. You know, it's really fun. To me, Instagram, there's not much creativity in posting a picture and maybe, you know, something clever. Uh, Facebook, same thing. But this is actually, you know, a creative endeavor. So uh, I'm having fun with that. Oh, great. Well, I want to thank you for being with us on the show and we wish you the best of luck. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight, and I'm, I'm definitely going to uh, get uh, to know you a little bit better. <laughs> thank you for listening to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. To learn more about Indie Beacon services, to be a guest on the show, or to advertise on our show, please visit our website. Indie Beacon Radio with the host, B. Alan Bourgeois. Indie Beacon Radio is produced by B. Allen Bourgeois for authors Mark and Guild LLC, copyright 2020. Voiceover by Randy James, Lydia Bello, and B. Allen Bourgeois. To be a sponsor of the show or for more information, please email us at info at authorsmarketingguild.com. To be interviewed for the show, please complete the form at radio.authorsmarketingguild.com. Music Always Rejoice by Ram Cord.